Won't you sing this song to my friend? This blood drenched song to my friend. He has cut open my heart just one slash. This beautiful black eyelash. Don't let my blood spill on. Well, hello everyone, and welcome to Depth Insights, where we take a depth psychological look at news and events that are going on in your world. I'm your host, Bonnie Bright, and I'm also the founder of Depth Psychology Alliance, which is a free online community for everyone who's interested in depth and union psychologies. And you can find that at www.depthpsychologyalliance.com. So come join us there. We have a ton of videos and blog posts and articles and all kinds of opportunities to connect around depth psychology and union oriented events. And I am here today with James Newell, who is a musician, singer, songwriter, and also an accomplished scholar in his own right with a PhD in history and theory of religion. And James, I'm really happy to be here with you today. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Well, it's great because in addition to those things that I mentioned, you also have tremendous expertise in union and depth psychology. And of course, you are on the board for Depth Psychology Alliance and We have had the benefit in the organization of your expertise and your contributions for many years now. And I'm really excited to let people know that you're going to be teaching an upcoming course, which is a college level course. It will be done online. And that's going to be an introduction to union psychology. So anyone who's interested in depth psychology but hasn't had much of a chance to really delve into some of Jung's techniques will be able to get in on the theory and a lot of the teachings that are very core to his psychology. So it's exciting to see that you're going to be doing that. I'm excited about it. It's been well received when we did it in the past. Absolutely. And this is um, going to be even new and improved and Of course, there will be a free introductory session that happens on September 24th, 2016. So anybody who's hearing this and has a chance to get in on that, we invite you to stop by and you can find out information about that on DepthPsychologyAlliance.com as well. And then, of course, the course starts a week later, which is October 1st. So, uh, James, I'd like to just read your bio at the moment, and that way everybody can have more of a context for who you are and and an understanding. And just mention also that the music that we heard at the beginning was your music and really beautifully done. And and we'll listen to a little bit more of that a bit later as we have our conversation. But let's, let's go to the bio. So, James R. Newell, Ph.D., MTS earned his PhD in history and critical theories of religion from Vanderbilt University. And he holds a master's degree in pastoral counseling and theology from the Vanderbilt University Divinity School. In addition to offering private counseling and teaching, James teaches online religious studies courses for Central Michigan University, Excelsior College, and Thomas Edison State College. As well, he serves on the board for Depth Psychology Alliance, as I mentioned, and is beginning to do a lot of online teaching for us. And James also produced the video some of you may have seen, which is called An Introduction to Depth Psychology. And you can find that in the video archives library where we have actually hundreds of videos on Depth Psychology Alliance as well as on our YouTube channel. So it's a a great 20 minute introductory video that really traces the origins of depth psychology and examines some of its core tenets. And so it's, it's a really wonderful introduction if you are interested in the topic and, again, haven't had a chance to see that. So come check that out. And then the last thing I'll say is James has spent much of his working life as a professional musician, singer, songwriter, and multi-instrumentalist with interest in jazz, blues, folk, world, and devotional music. And since his youth, James has worked with a variety of blues greats, including John Lee Hooker and uh, several others, which James, I'll let you mention because it's, it's quite an impressive list. And I've heard some of your music over the years and it's just really absolutely stunning. And you have such a diverse array of styles and, and different kinds of things that you do. So can you start us off by talking a little bit about the music piece of it? Because this is such a beautiful way to enter into a space that's not quite ordinary, at least for me on a daily basis. Sure. I, um, well, I love music and have since I was young and it's kind of, it's difficult to say much about it. I mean, just professionally, I started out with a great interest in blues and the great old blues people. And then was sort of shocked that I ended up moving to the Boston area and quite surprisingly ended up playing with a man named Luther Georgia boy, Shaky Snake Johnson, who uh, Luther uh, was a a black man from Georgia who had played for many years during the 60s and 70s with Muddy Waters. He was in Muddy Waters' band. And after 
playing with Luther because of that, with Luther and the band, we were the backup band for John Lee Hooker. We opened up for, we did many, many shows opening for Muddy Waters and we, uh, James Cotton would come down and play with us and Hound Dog Taylor. And I ended up working with Junior Wells and uh, played uh, Big Joe Turner who did the original Shake, Rattle and Roll back in the 50s. And just a lot of, I just because of my connection with Luther, I just opened up a lot of doors to play with a lot of great people. And for me, it was just like having a great front row seat at an incredible concert because I just love these guys. And I never dreamed that I'd, you know, not only get to hear them so much, but uh, see them up close and work with them. And it was just a wonderful experience. So that I started out uh, playing drums because of a childhood injury. And uh, I wanted to play guitar. And as I was doing these performances playing drums, I then developed my, I, I learned how to play, I did it in my hand as a kid, and I learned how to play left-handed, even though I'm right-handed, I play guitar left-handed, and started developing when we were off and, and not playing gigs, I'd play bars and things like that, and developed, uh, started writing songs and doing that, and that just grew and grew, so that's sort of the beginning of it, but I had quit school when I was young, and uh, it was kind of essential that I uh, make perform well enough that I could make a living at it. And I managed that for many years. Not to, did not make a fortune, but had a wonderful time. Well, it's an amazing gift. And, uh, you know, the topic of our conversation today is really Jung, the arts and spirituality. And so bringing that music into it, my experience has been that music can really transport me to a completely different place in a way that no other vehicle has really proven to be able to do. And so, uh, again, I've heard some of your music. We'll listen to a little bit more as we go. And it's really interesting, isn't it, how our, our daimon, what James Hillman calls our daimon, is constantly at work kind of pulling us toward our future, whatever that is. And when you mention the injury, it, it brings up the whole archetype of the wounded healer for me. And, you know, we talk about that a lot in psychology and how people that have difficulties and face certain challenges end up often being the ones who are able to offer healing to others at a later date because they manage to overcome those and, and learn and grow from those themselves. And so uh, it's really interesting, I think, that you sort of entered the whole space of music. At the very portal for your music was actually an injury. Physical. It's true. It, is, it was really a surprise to me because I didn't expect Certainly, I didn't expect that to happen, but I really, my interest in music and my interest in depth psychology and my interest in spirituality really all resulted from this childhood trauma. I was, really, I was very young, I was four years old and nearly bled to death, went through a glass door while I was playing and they cut, cut a piece of glass, went right through my arm and severed all the nerves and I had no feeling. They were, for a long time, they were saying they were going to have to amputate the arm, but it was, it was long story of healing from that. But part of my interest in music originally was that it was uh, physical therapy uh, for my arm, would be exercise for my arm. That's why I, I tried to play guitar, as I said, and couldn't do it because I'd injured my hand so badly I couldn't make chords with my left hand. But I, I thought, well, drums would be a good, I was doing a lot of physical therapy. I thought drums would be a good way to exercise my arm. And it proved to be true. And I certainly didn't expect that to open up into a career path. But the trauma itself, the accident itself, there was a lot of tension and, and uh, dysfunction in my family growing up. And uh, this was, uh, I was hospitalized for three weeks. And really the hospitalization was more traumatic than, than the injury itself. Because in those days, the parents weren't allowed to stay with the child. They thought, well, it was all right if a parent visited children. But when the parent left, the child would become hysterical. And I thought, well, that's just too disruptive. So they figured, well, it's better if the parents don't visit at all. So uh, it was really an isolation and it was very, very difficult. And it was something that I never, never really felt like I was part of the family again. There was sort of a, an isolation that happened. So that trauma, first of all, music was profoundly healing for that. So I was really interested in that. And as I got older and more and more of the effects of the trauma interfered with my life, I became interested in depth psychology. I became interested in spirituality. And for me, all three of those things were healing modalities. For one thing, I didn't think of them intellectually in that way. I just knew that I felt more healing happening in me and I felt more balanced and more grounded when I was engaged in some spiritual activity or some musical activity or some uh, study of depth psychology. All those things kind of gave me hope. So that's kind of where I 
was emotionally and and in time and space and i ended up one thing i learned is that you have to get out of dysfunctional situations and so when i was 15 i had an opportunity to play with a band and i moved out and left home and and that was kind of the that had pluses and minuses to it but it was an interesting start of my career yeah and a very unique one and again i just i'm, I'm kind of amazed because I hear these stories from other people. It was certainly not my experience, but uh, you know, our soul is really taking us on a journey. And and then here you are, all these years later, and and you're a scholar, and you teach college level courses, graduate level courses on te using technology a lot. And so you're the influence that you're able to have at this stage is kind of juxtaposed for me to that. 15 year old boy that left home in order to join a band and, and you know, provide his own healing. We, we all have that inner healer that is at work in us all the time and really en enables us to be able to find a path that can, that can be healing for us. I wonder if you can talk about the, the depth psychology piece of it and then maybe we can put those together. You've already begun to talk about the healing aspects of music, both um, being around music and also playing music of your own. You've also talked a little bit about the spirituality piece of it, but what about Jung? Where, where did he land? At what point in your life did he come into your life? And, and what was the initial draw there? Sure, well, it was pretty early, surprisingly. One thing I learned early on from my father was that he encouraged me to read a lot. And when I left in, to join this band, I was playing with a woman named Helen Schneider, who's now a big star in, in uh, Europe. She's an actress and a theatrical star, and, and was, it's really odd that she ended up in this small town, but her and her husband and their kind of cohort taught me a lot about music and also encouraged, as, as other people did, encouraged me to read. And there's one guy in the group who was a wonderful old friend, uh, we called him the, the bread man, which is a whole long story. But he, he having seen my relationship with my mother, I didn't realize that this at the, at the time, but having seen my relationship with my mother at 15 years old, he suggested that I should read Sigmund Freud. I didn't know what that was all about, but he suggested I should read Freud. So I did, you know, pretty precociously at around probably 16 or 17, I managed to get a copy of uh, Freud's theories of sexuality and his various... Uh, um, I think totem and taboo and a couple of things. And so I was reading a lot of Freud and I was, I love Freud. I still love Freud. I think Freud is just an incredible genius. And, but there are certain limitations and I was interested, as I said, I was interested in, I read the new Testament. I read, and I don't know what exactly I can't, well, actually I do know my grandmother was a big influence on interesting me in world religions and, and just having a, a spiritual sense. And she'd made some books available to me. So I was, I was, did a lot of studying, even at uh, 16, 17 years old, I was reading Bhagavad Gita and the uh, Upanishads and the Dhammapada, which is the words of the Buddha. And in the process of that, I'm reading Freud and Freud is saying, and I don't remember what, I think it may have been totem and taboo, I'm not sure, but so I'm reading Freud and, and he says, well, to get into this would be to getting more into uh, religious questions. And if you want to know more about religious questions, you really should read the works of my colleague, Carl Jung. And, and at the time, I, of course, I'd, I read it as Carl Jung because I never uh, never heard his name and it looked like Jung to me. So, uh, but I, I thought, well, that's interesting. And I love Freud and Freud recommends somebody he must be good. And it's ironic now, looking back, that Freud would be the one suggesting Jung, but he he did. They, they somehow maintained some sort of, even though he was obviously, you know, you know, kicked Jung out of the movement and the psychoanalytic movement and all that. He, he still had some kind of respect for him. But I, I searched and searched. It was very hard to find books by Jung at that time. This is 1970, 1971, 72. And there were only a few. The, the collected works had been mostly, I think, produced and published, but they were in hardcover and they were very expensive and they just didn't show up in, in bookstores. I finally found the portable Jung, which was edited by some guy I'd never heard of named Joseph Campbell. And a great, I highly recommend that people want an introduction to Jung. It's a great selection of, of his books, Portable Jung. I also found Jung's two essays on analytical psychology. And I, I also, I highly recommend those are great classic essays on just the basics and the outline of his theory and how he, he makes a clear distinction between personal and collective unconscious. And so that was on 17 or 18, I began reading that. And because there weren't that many books by Jung that I could find, I found, I 
the Tristan Bollingen series was out in paperback. I found many books by Esther Harding, who I just adore, and particularly the eye and the not eye was really important to me because it really kind of parses out the the basic anatomy of the psyche for Jung, and, and in a way that that later Jungians didn't do, because it's really it's a kind of objects relations, object relations that Jungians don't usually do object relations. But Esther Harding provides this in, in a book called The Eye and the Not Eye. And I read her book, The Way of All Women and Women's Mysteries and the Psychic Energy, Its Source and Its Transformation. And big, big, big influence then and still was Eric Neumann, his origins and history of consciousness without that. And that was, wow, that is, was then and still is just a really, really great organizer of, even Jung in his introduction to that book just praises Neumann for going places that Jung would have liked to have gone but didn't have a chance to go. And if so people haven't of, seen that book, I, it's about this thick, but it is absolutely one of the best references for, for depth psychology in general and the whole mm -hmm. evolution of it and how it came about. Yeah, it's a yeah. fascinating book. Well, it sounds like you had a lot of, gosh, a lot of influence at a very early age. I'm really kind of amazed to think that you were starting to read these things at age 16 and 17. You know, I, I didn't discover depth psychology in any way, shape, or form, and even things that were more esoteric or spiritual or religious to a, a certain degree. I, I didn't do much of that kind of reading until I was probably in my late 30s, if not early 40s, and it uh, has really affected my life quite profoundly, but I still can't claim to understand everything that I that I read, you know, and and I'm, I'm sure you're not claiming that either. But but uh, to be able to to pick up some of those things like the Upanishads and, and Freud and and to stick with them, and to really begin to integrate that is is quite a profound process for a young man at the time. I also wanted to say I'm really happy to hear about the influence that your grandmother had on you in moving toward things that were more of a spiritual nature. It really, for me, brings back this whole idea of the archetype of the wise old woman, but but also the feminine. You know, it's the feminine that is needs to emerge, I think, to push us toward some of these kinds of solutions and, and healing processes and, and understandings. And so I like that. And then I correlated that, of course, with you mentioning the works of Esther Harding, who also was one of the really remarkable pioneers of depth psychology itself, and yet does not get nearly enough credit, I think. Yeah, not just depth psychology, but everybody's into the goddess these days. And she was absolutely the first person to publish something about the goddess from the feminine Jungian point of view. Her book, Women's Mysteries, is still a classic and it really sets up that whole goddess uh, having access for, for women to have a powerful identity in relation to the goddess. She just set it up beautifully. And my grandmother, when I say grandmother, I know a lot of people have this idea of, you know, with the little lady baking cookies. And my grandmother was one of the first uh, female chiropractors in the state of New York. I actually found, while searching online, searching her name, I found uh, a uh, report of her being arrested in, in Massachusetts for practicing chiropractic without a license. It was illegal to be a chiropractor in the 50s you know, or 40s, I think it might have been, in, in, in Massachusetts. So she was, uh, she was quite a pioneer as a healer herself, and she, she introduced me to health food and uh, just natural healing. She had the Prevention Magazine, which became famous much later on, but she had it a lot earlier than, than other people. And it's just a, she was a wonderful influence in many ways. Oh, that's great. I love to hear those stories. I think that's really remarkable. Clearly, you got some of her DNA. <laughs> as you yeah, she, also, yeah, she also lived in, yeah, I definitely got her DNA, uh, some of the Scottish fiery Scots, but she, uh, she also lived in Woodstock, New York, and I got exposed to a lot of uh, interesting <laughs> influences <laughs> in Woodstock as well. Well, yeah, and the music, the whole music culture, you know, that's associated with that is, is yeah. I'm sure, you know, had a pretty impactful influence on your life. So, you know, James, one thing that you have done, which I neglected to read in your bio, is you have produced a number of CDs, and of course your latest one is something called Songs of Hafiz. And while we're talking about spirituality, and again, just coming back to the healing power that music has had, some of those songs are absolutely amazing. I wonder if we could maybe, as we move into the next segment of our interview, just listen to a few seconds of one of the songs from that, or some of your other music if you have it. Sure. Well, let me just say something. Yeah, I would like to play. We could play something from a, a song from Hafiz. Now, this is drawn from Sufi poetry. Hafiz is a great Sufi poet in Persia. 
modern day Iran, people still, they'll keep next to their Quran, they'll keep a, a copy of Hafiz because they just hold Hafiz in the same esteem or the very, you know, only, second only to the Quran. And his poetry is very, in all Persian, the Sufi poetry tends to be very symbolic and is very, very amenable to Jungian interpretations. And in this song, it's called Into the Mirror of My Cup. And the symbolism is that the cup is in Sufi poetry, it's particularly Persian Sufi poetry. The cup is the heart. The wine is love for God. And you become intoxicated with love for God. And the beloved is God. So you become drunk with love for the beloved. And there's all this sort of love poetry, but it's really spiritual and focused on uh, a... In, in the plain sense, a relationship with God, but also from a Jungian sense, it's about this dialogue with the unconscious that we all look forward to. So I want to play a little bit of that if I can locate it. Yeah, that would be great. I really think that bringing the power of music into such a, an event, even as an online conversation, can really have a profound effect on everybody. So just want to invite everybody, if you're listening, feel free to just kind of take a deep breath and sink into this and let's listen to it together. Into the mirror of my cup The reflection of your glorious face fell And from the gentle laughter of love Into a drunken state of longing I fell Just gives you a little taste of uh, Hafiz. I don't want to stop. <laughs> it's fantastic. It's just, you know, the Thank work you. that really came to mind, the, the, it was a very much of an embodied feeling when I heard that, and I can't imagine that this is not having the same effect on everyone else, is, is a sense of worship. I mean, it's really a sense of, of celebration on some level, but just a very reverent kind of deep celebration of whatever it is. And, and that's, that's the power of music in general but especially that kind of music it, it's very powerful you're playing all the instruments on that as well no no i play the guitar and sing and i wrote the as i said i adapted the persian lyric to english and i wrote the the musical setting but not the Beautiful. absolutely stunning and and uh, again i mean just to be able to incorporate some of that kind of thing in a daily practice, I think can be very powerful. So anybody who's listening, I, I suppose they can buy the CD online at your website, which I neglected to mention as well. It's symbolsoftransformation.com is one place that they can find it. Well, and uh, there, I have a special website for the CD, which is the songs of Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. Let's, let's just take the next few minutes that we have. And I wanted to dig in a little bit to, just one last question kind of related to this topic, and that is maybe I'll talk a little bit about the difference between spirituality and religion, according to you, because this was something that Jung spent a lot of time on, as, as you and I know, and it's, it's such an area of specialty for you because your doctorate is in world religions, and you've spent a lot of time doing that. You teach a lot of courses on it, and you're extremely knowledgeable about many different kinds of religions, but you know, where does the spirituality come into that? I've often heard depth psychology referred to as one of the most spirit or the most maybe spiritual psychologies. So how, how do we make that connection? Is, is a person religious? Is, are they spiritual? Where do the two meet? It's a good question. And it's one that is actually a problem. As I, you know, I, as you mentioned, I got my doctorate in, in religious studies and a history of religions and all religion is this, there's an ongoing uh, argument going on among scholars of religion about they want to jettison the word religion altogether because it's it's kind of meaningless in many ways it's not it has to cover a huge scope uh, you can't really define it properly some people say well it's about worshiping a god but then you got buddhists who don't they're basically atheists or you could certainly you can be an atheist and still be a buddhist so there's there's this whole scope of things there's also the 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 question that comes up or the 
what what comes up in my mind when you say, well, what's the difference between religion and spirituality? And many people think about religion. When you hear religion, you think of naturally institutional religions. You, you think of organizations and extroverts, of course, extroverts, if they're interested in religion, tend to be, become sociologists because they want to know what the institutions did, what was their impact. If you read you know, world histories, usually they barely ever mention religion. Religion doesn't even get mentioned. Uh, Christianity doesn't get mentioned until about 400 AD because they didn't really do anything. They didn't, imp- they didn't fight any wars. They didn't impact any sociological or economic things. They didn't uh, take over any empires or anything. So for introverts, it's a different story because introverts, uh, I count myself as an introvert, and I don't know I've heard you say that you count yourself as an introvert, mm-hmm. and many, many unions we find are introverts because you could, it's difficult to be an extrovert. You can't, not impossible, but it's difficult to be an introvert and be a union because it's <laughs> so interiorly focused, mm-hmm. and spirituality tends to be focused on interior things, but not entirely. And so I think... I mean, one of my favorite quotes is from a, a Persian spiritual master named Meher Baba, and he talks about how if you look at the religions on a, on a wheel, and each spoke of the wheel on the outside is, is the institutional religion, and as you get closer and closer to the hub, the hub, the hub being God, or if you're a Jungian, be the archetypal self, but as you get closer and closer, there's less and less distinction. They, they, they seem to be more, they begin to blend more and more and more together. So I think the the answer of what's the difference between religion and spirituality tends to be one, for example, in Islam, they have this distinction between shariat, which is the external rules and regulations of religion, and tarikat, which is an inner personal path, an individual path. And Sufis tend to be followers of tarikat or the individual path, and the, the legalists and the, the ulama and the scholars and the, the jurists who make up Sharia law and all that tend to be external and interested in the rules. So I think when we choose an individual path, trying to find our highest good and trying to get in touch with that center, that, that ultimate concern, Paul Tillich uses the term uh, ultimate concern for religion. When we choose our own way to enunciate and to draw closer to the heart of our ultimate concerns, we're tending to be more spiritual and when we're more interested in we may still be interested in those things but we want to work in a social way we want to have a building we want to have people who come and get together and do things that's more institutional and more religion that's not necessarily true but that's how i think about it yeah uh, i think that i mean i perceive it very similarly as well and of course you know, uh, <laughs> there's a lot of people that still don't distinguish between the two things, but clearly the, in union psychology, this whole path of individuation for me just tends to be such a spiritual journey. There is no other way to look at it. You can't possibly individuate according to Jung in the way that he looks at it, unless you're willing to engage with those sorts of things that are spiritual in nature and are awe inspiring. And so again, that, that just brings me back to this whole idea of music and how what, what a tremendous portal it is to, to be able to launch us. And of course, there are many things that can offer spiritual experiences to us. But uh, just- Well, let me say something about that, because this is an important, as you might guess, I think a lot about that, and it's important to me. And in terms of Jung, and, well, I won't say depth psychology, just, just Jung. Jung defined archetypes as being something that when you encounter it, one of the signs you're in an archetypal field or an archetypal realm is that it's numinous. There's, there's, a, there's a sense of the numinous which is the term for Rudolf Otto about uh, experiencing the sacred, experiencing the mysterium tremendum, the mysterious mystery, the fascinating mystery. So my idea about music is that music is a symbol of the numinous. It's a symbol that we actually encounter of the numinous. It's symbol when, when we hear music, it constellates the numinous for us, whether it, it could be a blues song about, you know, getting your woman, or it could be a spiritual song, a gospel song, it could be a song like the songs of Hafiz, but whatever it is, just hearing the notes in an organized way tends to constellate the numinous. So I think of it as, as in that way. Hmm. Hmm. That's so interesting. I think you're spot on, actually. Well, as we close here, 
again, just a reminder to everybody, James is going to be teaching a college level course on Jung, an introduction to Jung, and we'll really dig into his theories in that particular course. It's an eight week course, plus of course there's the free introduction, which will happen again online on September 24th. James, for a long time, you've been thinking about the value of offering college level courses on Jung, and particularly online, of course, is wonderful because now people can tune in from anywhere. Why, why do you feel that it's so important to include Jungian psychology at this level? Can you just say a, a last word about that? Sure. Well, one reason is, of course, online is because simply because there's, there may not be that many Jungians or people interested in Jung in a given community, but online we've got the whole community of the world and it, it opens it up but it's important to have a real grounding in theory. And this is, of course, Jung himself, this course that we're, we're putting on, and it's about Jung's theory, not other theories. So being able to distinguish, I think, is important. As you were saying, Jungian psychology calls us to spiritual endeavors, and it's often difficult to, when you get into that sort of soup of the collective unconscious, it's hard to know where you are, what's going on, am I being spiritual, am I being, where, where's the psyche in this, and where's the, where's the metaphysical reality, where's the psyche, where am I, and being able to have touchstones, and Jung is such a remarkable person, because during his own inner life, he just dropped into, as he calls it, uh, the unconscious, deliberately, in a way that people rarely did in uh, 1913, 1914, when he started his Red Book, and started that whole journey inward, and he developed through that process touchstones and they're very very useful and they're very it's very important for someone if they're going to say they're doing it depth psychology to be able to discern where they are where the touchstones are where the things are that you can hang on to so you don't just going to get washed away in the in the yeah. soup of of the numinous yeah yeah it's a that's a great way to put it i mean it really creates very much for me as well a map and you know in my experience these kinds of spiritual experiences happen to everybody sometimes they sort of land on you <laughs> yeah you know land on your head out of the blue that's sort of what happened to me and and by not having a background or a context in which you can begin to understand the these powerful forces and events that are at work in our lives uh, it, it's a real detriment if you don't have that kind of background and understanding. So I agree with you. It's a really important and powerful way to just begin to provide some context. And even those of us who know quite a bit of Jungian psychology, have had background in it, or even have done advanced degrees in it, for me, it's always good to go back and just review some of those tenets because it, it brings it right back into my life, into a you know, place where I have those tools at my fingertips. And, and, and also where it helps me to articulate some of those to other people. So if I'm going through something or I'm trying to make meaning of my life, I can also turn around and, and better articulate what's happening in, in the relationships that I have in my life. Yeah, and there's, other, there's another reason too, which has to do with the fact that depth psychology now, Jung has been gone for some 56 years now, and there's so much growth that's happened in depth psychology. And people say Jung, and they may think they're talking about Jung, but really they're talking about James Hillman, or they're, they're talking about uh, Eric Neumann, or they're talking about, there's so many different Jungians, there's so many different paths that have gone different directions, that it's good to know, to have a sense of where Jung was, what his scientific project was, and you know how that's grown, how things are different. It's not that it's that important. That it's, I certainly don't want to put a dogma forward that you have to be a Jungian and you have to do it this way. But I think it's very important that you know where you are in relation to Jung, where you are in relation to James Hillman, where you are in relation to Freud, where you are into other in relation to self psychology, where you are in relation to all these different things, because it's not all the same, and it makes a difference. Particularly if you're working with people, it makes a difference where you are and how you approach the work. Yeah, very true. Absolutely true. And thank you for making that distinction because I also want to be clear that Jung, you know, had his flaws like everybody does. And so, uh, but there's just so much value that we can take from there. Well, James, as we close out, I would love to get another minute of music. So maybe we can do that as we're closing here. And then I'll just remind everybody at the end where we can find out more information. Great. Well, thanks, Bonnie. And here's, this is another song of Hafiz and it's called the songs of Hafiz. Although my heart is on fire with distress and foaming with violence, the 
seal has been pressed to my lips And I drink this blood in silence Let the love in the singer's voice Should strike me defenseless I would fall into a trance And the songs of all faiths Leave me senseless Leave me senseless Oh, leave me senseless Absolutely gorgeous. You know, I have to say, I was in Turkey a few years ago, and um, I had the chance to see Sufi dancing, and, um, you know, that just took me right to that place where they... You know, the idea is that the arm is up on one side and down on the other because they're channeling the spirit from, you know, from the heaven to the earth or, or however you want to look at that. And um, just I, that really put me into that, that image of, of them just channeling that coming right through there. Really beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for being with me today, James. It's been just absolutely delightful to spend some time with you. And I just want to remind everybody that you can learn more about James and his work at symbolsoftransformation.com or also www.jamesrnewell.com. And then, as we mentioned, you can find out more about the CD and James's music, really beautiful music, at thesongsofhafiz.com. And so I encourage everybody to go look at it there. Also, come check out James when he's teaching the free intro class on Jung 101. That's on September 24th, 2016. You can find out more about that at DeafPsychologyAlliance.com. Thank you so much, James. Thanks, Bonnie.